Good morning, good evening, uh, afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Ken Lynch. I am Vice President of Marketing at Senate. I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of your day today to join our webinar titled Leaders and Lessons in the IoT and Natural Gas Utility Space, being presented by New Cosmos USA and Senate. Before we get started, I've got a few housekeeping items to let you know about. By default, all participants are on mute. There is a chat box available at the bottom of your screen uh, that allows you to type in questions to the host uh, should you be having any type of technical difficulties, and we'll try and work with you to resolve those. There's also a Q&A function at the bottom, uh, which allows you to submit questions to the presenters. Uh, we will be answering as many of those as possible during the webinar or, or as the webinar concludes. Uh, but for those that we don't get to, we'll follow up as soon as possible uh, after the conclusion of the, the presentations. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted for future viewing. Uh, we'll also be emailing a link for playback of the webinar to all registrants. In terms of the agenda for today, uh, we've got a lot to cover. Uh, New Cosmos will be providing a brief overview of their organization and then spend some time reviewing uh, the gas safety industry challenges and the evolution of the market and how their products have been instrumental in protecting people and property uh, from natural gas incidents. Uh, this will be followed by an introduction uh, by Senate, an overview of IoT, uh, low power wide area networks, LoRaWAN, and in particular, a review of why LoRaWAN is an ideal choice for the gas safety and utility markets. And then we'll close out with our Q&A session. Now I'd like to introduce our, sp our speakers. Uh, presenting for today's webinar are Julie Harris, Senior Marketing and Communications Manager at New Cosmos USA. Mark Ewan, Executive Vice President of Senate, at, um, of Sales at Senate. And Ron uh, Lazarus, COO of New Cosmos USA, will be joining for the Q&A portion of the presentation. And with that, I think we're all set to get started. And Julie, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Wonderful, Ken. Thank you so much for hosting this wonderful um, and exciting webinar on uh, leaders and lessons in the IoT and natural gas safety utility space. Excited to be here with all of you today. And we can go ahead and kick it off. Uh, so, Excited to start by sharing a bit about uh, New Cosmos USA. Uh, our mission is to protect people and property with natural gas safety products. And our mission has never been more important, uh, especially with natural gas explosions occurring. It's super important for, for people to invest in natural gas safety systems. And it's really the smart choice given that over half of the US homes now use natural gas as their primary heat source. In fact, every two days, explosion accidents involving natural gas pipelines occur and approximately $50 million in property damages happen per year. And sadly, most major gas incidents in the US include some type of gas leak result in over 40 deaths and 140 injuries. Um, what's more is the aging infrastructure that the US is challenged by. Um, right now, we have 1.3 million miles of gas mains in the US, and there's 5,600 miles of gas mains replaced each year. That's less than 1%. Um, and less than 1% additional pipelines are growing each year to add on to that infrastructure at about 9,800 miles per year. It would take over 230 years to fully replace every pipe in the US system. And let's face it, that's certainly a not realistic time frame. And it's, that's why it's so important if it would take two decades, two centuries to replace all these pipelines to make sure that we protect ourselves now. And that's really what we're in the business of doing. So our company profile, we're, we're able to support protecting people and property um, with locations of our office sites in over eight different countries with a thousand employees. We are currently publicly traded on the Japanese Nikkei stock exchange. 
and we have $280 million in revenue uh, generated annually. And our brand of natural gas alarms is called Denova Detect. And New Cosmos USA Inc. is a wholly owned subsidiary of New Cosmos Electric as of 2018. I must say, I am very proud to be a part of a company that has a series of firsts. Um, you may or may not know that New Cosmos actually created the first ever residential natural gas alarm in the world back in 1964. And you saw a sneak peek of that on the next slide. Um, we'll go back to that. Uh, we also developed the first ever battery powered advanced metered infrastructure natural gas alarm in the world. We developed the first ever battery powered AMI natural gas alarm deployed on a massive scale with one of the largest uh, utility, gas utility companies in the country, Con Edison, New York. And we've thus far deployed over 100,000 natural gas alarms across New York and will have deployed almost 300,000 by 2025. So we're really excited about that successful partnership. And we've created a lot of data points from that. Um, we, from that field experience. We're also the first ever to launch a battery powered seven year gas alarm product listed to the UL 1484 standard. And we currently hold uh, the number one status for um, the, the number one manufacturer of MEMS gas sensors worldwide. Um, we are one of the largest gas sensor and R&D facilities in the world. In fact, on the left, that circle represents our R&D facility. And we've sold over 70 million residential gas alarms worldwide with a 70% residential gas alarm market share in Japan. And here you'll see the world's first ever residential gas alarm built back in 1964. Our company has been around for over six decades. And over those six decades, we've been pretty proud to be able to serve our mission through and through of protecting people and property. When I look at this slide, um, I'm pretty proud to see that, you know, it's not just any product or device. This device has arguably saved many, many lives. And here's a data point to prove that. Um, so due to not, to Japan requiring natural gas alarms in households with um, where natural gas appliances exist over the past few decades. It has led to a direct impact and had a significant reduction of deaths due to natural gas explosions in Japan. In the 1960s, Japan had a large number of, of natural uh, gas appliances and they saw that the, the deaths due to natural gas explosions was high. So they implemented the natural gas requirements through legislation and installations. And over time, the number of deaths due to natural gas explosions significantly declined. And we're happy to report in 2019, there were zero deaths due to natural gas explosions. Also the same, zero deaths in 2020. So New Cosmos USA aims to pre help prevent deaths due to natural gas explosions in the US as well. A little bit about our alarm wireless integration. Our daughter board easily integrates with other utilities wireless networks such as LoRaWAN, ITRON, Aclara, Landis and Gear, and LTE. Um, some of the data that utilities request and is super relevant are the timestamp of payload messaging, hours spent powered on, and low battery status, system functionality, gas and temperature of the alarm um, and, and space, as well as humidity and temperature levels. And our gas alarm concentrations incrementally are measured between 1% LEL and 30% LEL. Let's do a deeper dive into some of our natural gas alarm product features. So our natural gas alarm offers a 10% lower explosion limit gas alarm threshold. And what does that 10% mean in comparison to our competitors? Well, that equates to 11 minutes faster escape time when compared to 25% lower explosion limits. 
And when you're talking about extremely dangerous, potentially natural gas explosions occurring, every second counts, of course. And so I don't need to tell you, 11 minutes faster escape time is certainly worth the investment. Our alarm also has been proven by Gas Technology Institute through a series of testing that um, we virtually eliminate nuisance alarms from common household chemicals such as bleach, ammonia, et cetera. Our, our product has MEM sensor innovative technology that offers that seven year wireless battery life. And we're excited to announce that we have a 10 year product uh, life coming soon as of January, 2023. Our natural gas alarm is battery powered and that allows for the optimal installation near the ceiling. So there's no unnecessary and unsightly cords needed. Uh, we also offer voice alerts, both in English and Spanish for residents. And our alarm does comply with the UL 1484 standard. Let's take a look at the MEMS sensor technology we offer. So one of the reasons we feel our customers, such as Con Edison, go with us is because we've designed our natural gas alarm products to make the customer's experience as seamless and effortless as possible. Um, with our alarms, we want our customers to have peace of mind to just be able to hang it up and trust it'll do its job. So we try to make that happen with one of the most powerful and effective energy saving sensors on the US market. Um, because our highly selective MEM sensor targets only methane, our alarm is highly nuisance resistant and it offers incredible power. In fact, it's 600 times more power saving energy when compared to conventional sensors. No AC power needed, easily installed near the ceiling with those lithium ion batteries and uh, nuisance resistant to those household chemicals. Now let's take a quick look at us, uh, New Cosmos USA and local and global news. So we feel it's really important for the public to know all about natural gas safety awareness. So we launched a national campaign that was picked up by Yahoo Finance, Associated Press and others. Uh, we've also recently partnered with Viewpoint to produce a Viewpoint video segment with famous actor Dennis Quaid and all about natural gas and um, safety as well as prevention of natural gas explosions. And this particular video was viewed on Fox Business News channel twice and we've shared this with uh, 177 affiliate channels. And New Cosmos really enjoys giving back to the communities that are impacted um, by gas explosions whenever possible. Um, sadly, fall of last year, the Edgewood community of Maryland um, had a devastate, devastating incident with a natural gas explosion where some were hospitalized and um, three homes were destroyed. And so we felt it was important to provide a donation to of uh, $25,000 worth of to Nova Detect natural gas alarms to be able to prevent this type of incident from ever happening again, as well as educating the community on natural gas safety protection. All right, so as I mentioned before, we, we have had a successful partnership with Con Edison New York, and we've developed a case study um, just really citing the benefits of the massive deployment, one of which is that, you know, from the field, our experience has shown how well um, our devices worked when put to the test. And since our deployment, um, as of currently 100,000 installed alarms, we've had almost zero false alarms, which really, I think, speaks to volumes of our products, um, products success. And we've also been featured recently in, in Newsweek International article. And um, lastly, we wanted to also mention how uh, important supporting the LoRaWAN standard is in enabling a fully open standard and offering a low cost alternative to cellular networking. So we introduced our alarm to support the LoRaWAN communication system back in 2020. 
And that was due to customer demand, open global standards, flexible network build out, robust network and device management with wireless connectivity on demand. And partnering with Senate has really allowed us to operate in offering a both a public and private network connection. Um, we're really excited to share the product that it is available today on the market. And now we'll turn it over to Senate to discuss the benefits of the LoRaWAN network. Okay, thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. This is Mark Ewan. I'm the head of sales and business development at Senate. And we'll get right into it. Senate is a leader in LoRaWAN. LoRa stands for long range. And we'll get into some of that in, in uh, subsequent uh, slides and what LoRaWAN means specifically. Uh, the company Senate is headquartered in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, we're just north of Boston. We're essentially a cloud platform and services provider, um, specifically taking a LoRaWAN network server, an open standards LoRaWAN network server, LNS for short, and wrapping it in a very robust OSS BSS platform, which is an operational and business support system. Um, this enables us to provide uh, very scaled deployments, and we'll get into this a little bit in these slides. Um, fundamentally, we offer two services. One we call NAS, which is Network as a Service, and the other we call PaaS, which is Platform as a Service. And fundamentally, one is for public network deployments, and the other uh, PaaS is for private network deployments. This, this slide illustrates our public network specifically, and the green uh, uh, areas that you see here are uh, publicly deployed LoRaWAN gateways. And these green um, dots, if you will, are, are expanding rapidly. Every day, 365 days a year, more dots are, are being added to this map. And you can go to our website, senateco.com, if you want to see a, a live map showing uh, coverage all over the world. I'm going to start out with a little story from the early days of Wi-Fi, going, going way back in time, um, as a kind of an analogy to what I'm going to describe as we go through these uh, subsequent slides. When I first got a, a Wi-Fi router for my home, I did it for a, a specific reason, and that was to untether my laptop. So that was sort of the anchor use case of, uh, of putting that network in my, in my home. Fast forward to today, and my home has many, many different uh, types of device, devices connected to that network. And so that anchor use case was um, the beginning of a, of, of a great relationship with, with Wi-Fi. We call this the consumer IoT, or Internet of Things. And uh, one thing of note is that all of the devices that you see here, and this is certainly not a comprehensive view, these are all either devices that have access to power, you plug them in, uh, or they're battery powered devices that you recharge very frequently. And we're, we're gonna talk about why that's a little bit different than what I'll call utility IoT or, or industrial IoT. So we're gonna get into real basics here. Uh, we talked about LoRaWAN, uh, LoRa being long range, L-O-R-A. Uh, we're gonna talk uh, about what is IoT. What is LP WAN? Um, we're going to talk uh, in some detail about the, Laura, the benefits of LoRaWAN and, um, and how some are calling LoRaWAN the, the Wi Fi of IoT, and then a little bit more detail on, on what Julie's been talking about with respect to the natural gas use case. So, starting off at the beginning, um, the, you know, the Internet of Things has many. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of terminology floating around the industry. You know, what, what is IoT? Some people call it IOE, the Internet of Everything. Um, the kind of the legacy term for it is machine to machine, but really this is all about digital transformation. And there are a lot of different, you can fill in the blank here, but we're making things smarter. So you, you, you talk about the smart version of, 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 a, of a utility meter, the smart 
connected version of a, of a methane gas detector. Um, so as a frame, I want to talk just really briefly about how things have been connected to the cloud over, over the course of time. So let's go back to the, the mid 90s when, when Netscape was founded and we first started uh, connecting things to the cloud. And those things were basically our computers. And if, uh, if you had a, a desktop computer, you, you generally connected it to uh, a wired internet connection. Uh, a laptop, uh, perhaps you had a, a wireless, but let's fast forward to, to the mid 2000s. The iPhone was launched in 2007, and now all of a sudden this, the number of things that were connected to the cloud or to the internet had, had this massive exponential explosion because now we had mobile devices connected to the cloud. And these were largely connected, uh, these were largely battery powered uh, devices that again, needed to be recharged, you know, frequently, probably every day, um, or they were plugged in. And most of the connections were um, to the cloud were, some of them were still hardwired into the, into the internet, but some, an increasing number were, um, were connected through Wi-Fi, cellular, and perhaps other technologies. Now let's go to today, and these, you know, these concentric circles aren't really as, as uniform as they appear here. The, you know, the, the explosion now is, is really truly um, exponentially exponential because now we're connecting everything to the cloud. And, um, and the, the really scaled uh, applications and use cases um, are, are by and large uh, battery powered devices. And we're gonna talk about that more. The methane, the methane leak detectors that Julie uh, uh, described are, are optimally running on a battery and a very long life battery. And so um, this is the, the sort of the evolution that I, that I wanted to paint the picture of. So what are things, just a level set? Uh, we're talking specifically not about phones anymore. I mean, from, a, from, a, uh, from the perspective of this dialogue, we're, we're, we're not talking about laptops, we're not talking about phones and tablets and so forth. We're really talking about devices. And there's two categories of devices. There's sensors and there's actuators. And the methane uh, sensor from, from New Cosmos is, is an example of a sensor that's gathering information. It's probably logging it in within the device. And then every, periodically will we'll kind of wake up uh, to optimize the battery, uh, wake up and do a, a intermittent transmission of that data to the cloud. Um, going the other direction, an actuator is a device uh, that is, is, um, is told by the cloud application what to do. Flip a switch, turn a valve, I'm going to send new, uh, new software down to the device, a firmware update, that kind of thing. So IoT is a very, a very broad umbrella term. And if you, if you kind of drill down on the, on the little uh, left-hand side box, there's really kind of three fundamental pieces. There's the device on one side, there's the cloud application on the other side where all the intelligence in the utility world, sometimes it's called a head end. Um, and in the middle, you have to connect those two things. You wanna get the, the data from the device to the, to the application or a command from the application down to the device. And in the middle is the connectivity layer. And so honing in on the connectivity layer, uh, you've probably heard a term called LP WAN. And, and LP WAN stands for Low Power Wide Area Network. And LoRaWAN is the star of that show. LoRaWAN is not the only LP WAN, but LoRaWAN is a very important um, player in the LP WAN space. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. So the first thing I did was I went to Google and I searched, why is LP WAN important? And really, if you look at the part in green, there, there have been a lot of use cases that have been envisioned in the past before LP WANs came along that just really weren't there there really wasn't a way to make a business case to make those work. And so now with LP, LP LP WANs coming along, the game has changed. And if you go to Wikipedia and you type in low power wide area network, aka LP WAN, you can see what what comes out of the uh, the Wikipedia article. Uh, long range, so again LoRa, uh, low power we're going to talk about the, the battery um, uh, uh, attributes of, of, of that. Um, 
kind of mind blowing to me when I first came came uh, came into the Laura ecosystem back in, in 2016 that there are literally commercial deployments where the battery is going to last for 20 years or more and and the only way we know that is through science because it takes 20 years to prove it right um, and it all boils down to low cost so we'll, we'll talk about that in some detail here another thing i want to mention is that laura the laura alliance uh launched laura wan in 2015 so we're we're growing up here it's 2022 now and it's probably been a few years now that LoRaWAN has been considered by most who are paying attention to be a de facto global standard. And just uh, late last year, we took the next step in the LoRaWAN world to being an actual standard. The Inter International Telecommunications Union formally recognized uh, LoRaWAN. This is a um, United Nations organization that's based in Geneva, Switzerland. This is the Law Alliance, again, founded in 2015. Senate is, is one of the founders um, on the board of directors and a, a key contributor to not only the original um, uh, uh, standard specification, but the ongoing evolution of the standard, along with a lot of very important companies that you see listed here. And this, these logos are just a small subset of the, of the number of companies that are in the Law Alliance, and it's growing very fast. Um, I pulled out a few names uh, for, for those in the utility world, um, in the industrial world, who, who might be interested in it, to know that there's a growing number of very significant uh, players in the utility slash industrial space that are, that are joining the Laura Alliance as members and, and making their contributions to the, to the global effort. This slide illustrates the board of directors. Again, Senate is on the board of directors alongside very notable companies from around the world. So again, uh, LoRaWAN is often referred to as the, as the Wi-Fi for IoT, or specifically the Wi-Fi for utility IoT. And I think what we're starting to see is that utilities are taking, a, a as digital transformation happens and as the future unfolds, very much of a multi-networking strategy um, uh, uh, and a combination. Some utilities have already made investments in, in large legacy uh, uh, protocols and, and communications technologies. Um, but just like we coexist every day as, just as you know, people with uh, cellular and Wi-Fi, and we use it for different purposes at different times, um, I, I believe that uh, utilities and other organizations across industry are going to continually uh, adopt a multi-network strategy of which LoRaWAN is certainly going to be a, uh, an important piece. And when we talk about LoRaWAN being the, the Wi-Fi for utility IoT, I want to make sure that everybody understands the distinction between Wi-Fi and LoRaWAN and why they're similar and why they're different. They're similar because they both coexist very nicely with other communications technologies, namely cellular. Um, they, uh, they're similar in that they, they both generally run in unlicensed wireless, wireless spectrum, unlike, you know, something like cellular that, that uh, requires in, in, in the vast majority of cases, you know, uh, FCC in the U.S. licenses and, and other licenses in other parts of the world. Where they're very different is uh, Wi-Fi, as we all know, is a short range technology with massive bandwidth. You can watch Netflix on, on Wi-Fi and do lots of other things. Um, LoRaWAN is sort of the opposite from that perspective. And this comes down to the importance, the key, the key important piece when you think about why, why has LoRaWAN become a de facto global standard and an international uh, formalized standard. A big part of that is because it's a low cost option that enables very long battery life, which is part of the reason it's low cost. So you can put thousands, millions of devices into a commercial deployment and be confident that the, uh, the, the end device isn't going to need to be touched to replace or, um, or recharge the battery or, and, that, and that kind of thing. So battery life is a really key uh, consideration here. Um, so, uh, just another point on, on the coexistence of, of LoRaWAN and cellular. 
when you put a Laurel Wing gateway on a tower or on a rooftop or on a pole or indoors or underground uh, in a basement, um, the, uh, the, that, that, that Laurel Wang gateway needs to, you know, first and foremost, communicate with the devices that are connecting to it. Um, but, but in addition to that, the, the gateway has to be backhauled, that information has to be backhauled somehow to the cloud. And so cellular often is that backhaul. And so there's a nice coexistence there. And in this next slide, we'll talk about some of the other flavors of backhaul. Um, I put cellular at the top because that's very common. Also hardwired connections like fiber and ethernet. There's, we even use satellite. There's, there's, there's uh, lots of different ways to make that happen. But fundamentally, the architecture of LoRaWAN is you have devices on one side. Again, you have cloud applications the intelligence, if you will, on the, on, the, on the other side of the spectrum. And in between, we have the, the communication, and that includes the gateways, the backhaul, and the, what we call the LNS, uh, the, the LoRaWAN network server with, with a, a, an OSS BSS wrapped around that. And Senate uh, arguably has the most robust uh, offering in that realm uh, 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 on the globe. Um, so just, just to reiterate, this is a bi-directional communication. The device will transmit its payload. Any LoRaWAN gateway within range will pick that up, will backhaul it over whatever backhaul it's connected to, to Senate. Senate then processes, deduplicates, manages all that, all that flow of information and sends it to wherever it needs to go. It can go to any uh, application in the cloud, whether that's a big, uh, you know, Azure or iOS in instance or something like uh, an AMI, you know, a legacy AMI uh, head end or what have you. So this kind of sums up the benefits and I put low cost and secure and bold at the bottom because th this is what, what it all kind of sums up to. We have to be secure, we have to check that box and LoRaWAN wouldn't be a global standard if it didn't check that box. So um, we can go into, Anybody who's interested, we can go into to deep technical detail on that on that uh, point as needed. On the on the low cost, it, it's it's a combination of, of things. LoRa again, long range um, enables low cost because you need fewer gateways to create coverage. And and um, if you need if you did need more gateways, that would be more cost, not only from the perspective of the capex but also operationally having to manage those, those gateways and get the leases for the towers if you're doing a tower deployment and that kind of thing. Um, and then because it's low bandwidth, um, you know, what is that actually a benefit? Well, yeah, you know, LoRaWAN is not, is not the uh, protocol or the network uh, flavor that, that you're gonna use for everything. You're gonna use it for use cases that require very little communication. And you know, methane leak detectors are a great example. Um, they generally are going to just do a little heartbeat to the to the utility through the through the cloud and say, "I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive." Maybe once a day, uh, maybe maybe more frequently than that. But it's a small piece of data, very infrequently being transmitted. This enables the long battery life, which translates directly into low cost. And then, if you talk to different device providers and/or solution providers out there that are deploying LoRaWAN applications, uh, they may have other flavors that are non-LoRaWAN based on their customer demand. And they will tell you that the, the bill of materials to do the LoRa version is lower. Um, and so that's a key consideration. So back to Julie's um, uh, comments about the methane uh, leak detector that they, they offer. This is a very, uh, very compelling use case on a, on a lot of levels. Uh, you know, human life, uh, property damage, mitigating that is, is important. And, um, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot going on to, to make that happen in the US, just like what's happened in, in Japan, which is a, an awesome success story. But it's, it's an application like that, or like metering, or both, that really anchor that you know, deployment of, of the network. And then again, back to my, you know, uh, my analogy of my, my uh, Wi-Fi in my, in my house, it opens the kimono. And, and a lot of it is education. Once, once, once the, the end user, in this case, the utility is educated about uh, LoRaWAN and the, and, the, and the vast benefits, 
you start asking, you know, what else is possible? And I just listed a few here, and I've got one more slide on, on that as well, which we'll talk about. This particular slide is directly from the uh, American Gas Association, uh, the Gas Technology Institute, um, presented at AGA uh, just recently and talked about the initiative in the uh, natural gas ecosystem to deploy solutions uh, for gas safety. And uh, Laura Wan has been uh, on the front and center of that, um, in including uh, methane leak detectors from, uh, from New Cosmos, their De Nova the Tech product, uh, uh, shutoff valves from, uh, from Lorax and from meter providers and, and lots of folks in the, in the ecosystem. National Grid actually did some trials. The, the California Energy Commission, which uh, helps operate the OTD, which is a consortium of about 28 uh, um, U U.S. natural gas utilities, are all involved in this, and it's it's a really exciting initiative that we're that we're proud to be a part of. Um, and in this slide, and I'm getting toward the end here, it, I, I I just really want to point out that. A, a key thing that utilities are interested in is control and flexibility. And you could argue that this is something that utilities haven't really had from the legacy uh, providers who have proprietary networking technology. Now, are they going to throw that out? Absolutely not. Um, I think they're going to continue to, you know, to uh, leverage the, investment, the investments they've made. But again, getting back to that multi-network technology future, um, having an open standards option where you can go to market and find cost-effective solutions from lots of different providers um, and, and, you know, place your bets on the ones that are going to deliver you the best, uh, you know, the best uh, value proposition. I think it's a very, very powerful feature that we have in, in store for us. Um, and, and I, I think I mentioned this, but just to, just to be clear, we offer both public and private deployments. And what's interesting is a lot of our customers will, will use both. So you may have a, like for an example, in, in Tampa, Florida, we have a very robust footprint of public coverage. Um, and we have uh, uh, solution providers who are putting uh, solutions into airports, into restaurants, into stadiums, and that kind of thing. And a lot of times they're taking their own gateways uh, to augment the public coverage. So these gateways are their gateways, so they're private, but they, and they may or may not decide to, to leverage the public network as an augmentation of that coverage. So it's, it's a totally flexible uh, business model and go-to-market model. And again, uh, Laura Wine gateways can be deployed pretty much anywhere. And that's one of the one of the really interesting powers of being able to get that footprint out where you need it. So again, back to my uh, uh, Wi-Fi analogy from my home. Um, in this case, we've got an you know you pick a geography and you get an anchor application. Now you have a very robust LoRaWAN network, whether it's public, private, or some combination, and you've got your anchor use case. And now you've become educated about the power of LoRaWAN. And, um, and all the partners and, and, uh, and providers that are in this ecosystem and growing very rapidly. And you start to see new and, and, and incremental uh, uh, use cases. What's interesting about this compared to my home slide with all the different devices connected to my Wi-Fi network is these are all battery powered devices. And I would say, just taking a quick uh, gander, this uh, probably the lowest number of years on any one of these use cases is probably in the you know seven to ten year range, and some of them are twenty plus year battery lives. So I'm just going to pop up this slide one more time, just to reiterate: we have a very robust and very rapidly growing public footprint of LoRaWAN gateways. 365 days a year, more more dots are going on the map, but this map does not represent any of our private deployments, and that's growing very rapidly as well. So what's the call to action? Is this an immediate opportunity? Absolutely, this, uh, this technology has been out now um, in the market for years. Uh, it's growing very fast globally. Um, how, do you, how do you get involved? Uh, I, I've got the, the four steps here. Um, you can go get a gateway. This, this the one I have uh, on here is an inexpensive uh, indoor version, um, or you can simply connect to our private 
uh, or to our public network, uh, which is which is very, getting more ubiquitous all the time. Um, we have a, a, a zero fee de developer portal, which is available for, for uh, non-commercial limited use. So you can set up an account and you can, uh, if you get a gateway, you can provision it on that account. You can go get some devices. You can talk to New Cosmos about getting a, a methane leak detector, or I, I put an example of a kind of what I call an off-the-shelf generic Loroland device. This particular one is probably you know, I'll call it tens of dollars. It's um, it's set up to do motion, light sensing, um, humidity and temperature sensing, and it gathers up all that data and transmits it uh, through Senate to to an application. And so again, the, the fourth piece is, and the third piece is our, our dashboard. And, and this is just a, a simple example of having a, a login to our, our platform for the connectivity management. And then, there's any number of, of IoT uh, destinations, if you will, for the intelligence in the cloud. Um, the head ends from the, from the major providers. This is an example of what I would call an off the shelf um, dashboard. Uh, I know New Cosmos has, has their dashboard. And so those are kind of the four pieces of the puzzle. Um, gateway, device, connectivity uh, provider like Senate, and then a, a, a solution provider that has the, uh, that has the uh, the application in the cloud. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to pass it back over to Mr. Ken Lynch. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Julie. Uh, great presentations from both of you. Uh, very much uh, appreciated and I think we've got Ron here on the line for Q&A as well. Uh, we do have a couple that have come in. Um, uh, Mark, I think this one might be for you. Um, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, isn't Laura Wan uh, compelling with NB-IoT and LT or competing with NB-IoT and LTEM? What advantages do Laura Wan have over NB-IoT? Uh, in my understanding, NB-IoT has better coverage uh, than Laura Wan, but Laura Wan is more competitive in connection fees. Uh, so Mark, you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I think, you know, if you, if you go back to those slides and, and we'll, we'll be publishing these slides, as Ken said, um, I, I have a couple of points on that. I, again, I don't, I don't view cellular or legacy uh, AMI connectivity options uh, as necessarily competitive to LoRaWAN. I view it as uh, complementary, just like in, you know, I talked about this a lot in my presentation. You know, I, I use cellular every day in my life. I use Wi-Fi every day in my life. Um, I do believe that utilities, uh, enterprises, industrial uh, companies across all verticals will use cellular when it makes sense to use cellular and they'll use uh, LoRaWAN when it, makes to use, when it makes sense to use LoRaWAN. Um, it's going to be driven largely by what the customer wants. And when, when the customers out there really roll up their sleeves and dig in deep and they look at the total cost of ownership, they look at some of the um, coverage capabilities, uh, some of the differences there, the battery life, those are, those are some of the things that are, that are, are going to be important. And again, if, if you need higher bandwidth and you need a, a quality of service that's tied to a licensed spectrum technology, then cellular might be the right, the right approach. Um, so I'll, I'll say there's a little bit of overlap. You're going to, you know, there's, there's going to be clear cases for LoRaWAN. There's going to be clear cases for cellular. And in between, there's going to be, you know, situations where, you know, you, you're going to have to make the call. Do I want to, do I want to go with cellular or LoRaWAN? I could go either way, and you're going to have to kind of uh, roll up your sleeves and look at, I think, uh, the total cost of ownership over 20 years. When you when you think about um, what what just happened um, or what's happening as we speak is the sunsetting of 3G cellular networks. So if you have devices that run on 3G in your implementation, and let's say you have a million of them out there. And now all of a sudden you have to go deal with a million devices. That's not very fun. And so LoRaWAN is is architected from the very beginning of its of its birth back in 2014. We we rolled it out in 2015. 
to be a, a, a network that never has to be sunsetted. Excellent, thank you. Um, I took notes on a couple others during the, the presentation. Um, uh, Ron, uh, this, this might be a good one for you. Uh, why has it been difficult to gain legislative approval across the nation for requiring natural gas installations and or more comprehensive requirements on gas leak monitoring and reporting? Okay, Ken, that's a, a great question. And maybe before I answer that, I just also noticed that there was a question from Frank asking about uh, how often are methane sensors samples? And if you wouldn't mind, I'll just answer that question quick. Sure. Um, and, and, and Frank, our gas alarms will sensor uh, actually once a minute when there's no gas present. Once uh, gas is detected and it reaches 50% of the alarm threshold, it increases to about once every 10 seconds. And then to answer your second question about uh, sounds continuous in order to get quick response, does that kill the battery? Uh, it can last an alarm, continuous alarm for a minimum of 24 hours. After that occurs, uh, it will actually stay in low battery where you get a low battery sound or warning for at least uh, seven days. So I hope that answers your question. And then Ken, you were asking about uh, legislation or someone had asked yes. about legislation. Yes. And, um, you know, everyone's aware that there is smoke alarm and carbon monoxide legislation or requirements for smoking CO alarms to be installed in homes. And for some reason, gas alarms have not been required. And within, I guess for the past few years, it's gas explosions have become more prevalent and what we're finding is that a lot of legislators have not even been aware of maybe the growing problem and the growing number of gas explosions. And unfortunately, they don't become aware until an event happens in their community. So as an example, in the state of Maine, where uh, Representative Breckett, there was an explosion in Maine. Unfortunately, a fire serviceman was killed during that explosion. And they uh, submitted a bill, or she submitted a bill, to be uh, to require gas alarms. And Maine, just as of January of 2022, became the first state to pass gas alarm legislation. And we see uh, more of a trend of that happening here in Illinois. Senator Wilcox has uh, proposed a bill for uh, fuel gas legislation. Uh, Senator Lamar in Tennessee has also submitted a bill for. Uh, requiring gas alarm legislation, and other states like New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and uh, I believe it's, uh, well, and I mentioned uh, Maine already, have pending legislation. So we are starting to see a trend towards it. Some states were waiting for the NFPA 17 to develop an installation standard for gas alarms. Um, I'm on a I'm a voting member on the NFPA 715, and I can tell you that uh, the NFPA just recently approved a, a standard that uh, installation standard for natural gas alarms. Now it's going to be up to the states and the building codes to uh, adopt those standards, but it will require or recommend that uh, gas alarms be installed in every room where there's a gas appliance. So I hope that you know also answers uh, that question. Yeah, very comprehensive. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Um, well, I've got you, and, and maybe this is for Julie. Julie, I think you did touch on this point um, relative to your new Laura Wan product, but another question uh, about your product line. Are there any upcoming product launches that we should know about from New Cosmos USA? I would say absolutely. Um, so we're, we're really excited to be able to showcase um, in January of 2023, our 10-year product, um, which will be which will be coming soon, um, and I'd like to also um, mention that that would be uh, available wireless connectivity with um, Landis and Gear and um, Itron, Eclera, LTE, etc. Ron, did you have anything to add to that? No, no, that pretty much covered it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, and. Uh, Got a few more minutes, so if you guys have uh, questions from the audience, please continue to submit. I've got one more uh, in the queue here, I think, for, for Mark. Um, 
I have heard about a lower WAN network called Helium. Is uh, Helium a Senate competitor? Thanks for that question. That's a, that's a good one. Um, Helium is a very interesting um, uh, entrant into the, into the LoRaWAN ecosystem. They, uh, they are uh, based here in my neck of the woods in the San Francisco area and have a blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, business model to incentivize um, what they call the people's network. And I think, I think an important distinction that I like to describe is what's, what's the difference between a network and a service? Um, a network, you could argue, is I go put a gateway on my roof or I put a gateway in my, in my uh, kitchen and now I have a, a network. Um, but, the, but the reality is that that is what, what the, what the way we refer to that is that's a radio access network or it's the RAN. And so we have, we have a number of partners across the LoRaWAN ecosystem that we call RAN partners. And so Helium would actually fall into being a RAN partner. Now, as you know, as is often the case in the world, you can be a partner and a competitor at the same time. So there is a there is a small uh, aspect of, of of the competitiveness between Helium and, and Senate, and that is that you can take your device or your million devices, and you can provision them on the Senate platform. And Senate is your service provider. You pay Senate a fee to to have uh, that access, just like you would pay Verizon when you provision your phone on Verizon. Uh, very, very similar, very similar business model. Um, you can also take your million and, and provision them on Helium and, and they would, you would pay in, in cryptocurrency for that. But, um, but the difference is that, that, that Helium isn't really set up to be what, what you would call a carrier grade service offering. Um, and I think they would, they would readily admit that at this, at this stage of the game. And, 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 that's a big part of the reason why they want to be partners with, with Senate because Senate is a carrier grade service offering. So the way we characterize it is that Senate is the on-ramp or the carrier grade on-ramp to the Helium network. So they're part of our extended, um, what we call virtual network, um, our, our public network. So if you, if you provision your device on Senate uh, to be a public device, and it's within range of any of the hun literally hundreds of thousands now of, of helium gateways that have been deployed uh, by the people, the people's network, then, um, then, then that gateway will pass your, your, your devices uh, messages to the Senate core. Excellent. Well, I think that's uh, what we've got for questions in the queue. Um, oh, there's we one question I saw. There's one more, sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, so Greg next, he asked, does New Cosmos offer natural gas detection equipment for heavy industry applications such as cement factoring? I just want to say, Greg, thank you so much for your interest. Um, New Cosmos does in fact offer equipment for industrial applications through our distributor DOD in the US. Um, these are manufactured by our um, parent company, New Cosmos Electric in Japan. Um, but we definitely would like to talk further. Um, so you can feel free to reach us. Um, Ron Lazarus, COO of our company, um, would be happy to talk more and his contact information, phone number 630-301-0572 or ronlazarus at newcosmosusa.com. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I think we've covered everything. We uh, appreciate your attendance. We had a great uh, attendance throughout the entire presentation. Uh, thank you to our presenters, uh, Mark and Julie. Uh, thank you for Ron for assisting uh, as well. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the program. And uh, for those of you who have registered, you'll receive a link uh, for the playback. And uh, please do reach out if you've got any further questions. Thanks very much.